Yeah, yeah, me, Marcus Visionary. Watch on a man. And you don't know the real general. Welcome to Marcus Visionary Podcast 03. And I want to thank everybody for locking in. Um, if you haven't subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button for me. I'm about 190 people away from uh, hitting my thousand mark where I can monetize this and, uh, you know, eventually not be doing this for free, you know, <laughs> uh, and we can get you some great content and so on and so forth. So thank you so much for everyone who has subscribed so far. Uh, hit the like button if you want as well. And uh, also notifications if you want to find out when we have our next podcast. All right. So first things first, I'm here with an artist who is uncompromisingly original. He's a DJ, producer, graphic artist, and mentor to many. He's been in the game for a very long while, putting in that work on multiple levels. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the dark-hearted warrior, Gremlins. Yeah, greetings and salutations. <laughs> He's going to cuss me out after about that intro. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyways, uh, me and Gremlins talk like every day, every other day, many times a week. So, and funny enough, we very rarely talk about music, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talk about feelings and whatnot. <laughs> Life, you know, but anyways, first things first, how you doing? Yeah, not too bad. You know, just chilling. Finally got a day off. Um, just woke up from a nap. Exactly. Yeah. Very yeah. nice. Very nice. Anyways, we're going to get it all in today. We're going to take things way back to your childhood up to present day. So <laughs> <laughs> where did you grow up? I uh, just grew up in Toronto on the east side, like uh, in the beaches. And then, you know, during the teenage years, pretty much all over. Um Scarborough, um, Markham, Young and Eglinton, Young and Davisville, uh, uh, downtown. <laughs> you named some areas that I know music is very big in, especially Markham and Eglinton. Did these places have like an impact on you musically? Like what were you listening to when you grew up? I mean, when I grew up, it was kind of a mixture of everything. Like, um, mm -hmm. you know, my dad was a huge fan of like jazz, um, rock, soul kind of stuff like that and then i grew up with all of that hip-hop reggae um dance music electronica which is uh you know i guess a precursor to edm and all that nice i was gonna ask you what was playing around the house you know um so your dad was into music see i didn't know that i would have yeah. never thought that yeah um so when when did you hear music and you thought this is something that I'd like to get into. Was it like in the hip hop days or or did um, did that come after like, when did actually you start collecting? Like what was the first thing that you actually bought? Um, well, I mean, I started like, obviously my dad had a bit of vinyl, like he didn't have the biggest collection because music was, you know, for him it was just a hobby and like something he appreciated. But yeah, I mean, my parents had, a lot, had some vinyl and then I guess it would have uh, it would have been with hip hop and reggae. Like I uh, I used to get a lot of forty fives with one of my friends, this kid Gareth, mm. and uh, we used to go down. You know, we we go by uh, all the record stores on your own street, get up all the stores like Tracks, Play D, and just buy hip hop records here and there. And that was all through high school. Right. Um, I wouldn't say at that point I really pictured. Uh, having any kind of uh, future in music, you know, it was just more as a hobby. And then a big uh, a big part of that was realizing that a lot of music wasn't available on CD or cassette. Right. And that most of it, like on vinyl, you get different mixes of stuff. So that's how I got into that. So basically, um, you were listening to hip hop. What are the things were you into at the time? Because you said you weren't quite thinking about a career in music or anything. Like that Music was just the soundtrack. What were you doing in high school that, like, you know, your interests and hobbies? I mean, my biggest interests and hobbies were sports. Like, uh, obviously, the predominant one for me was basketball. Yes. I, I used to, like, live, like, you know, basically eat, sleep, breathe basketball. So, uh, you know, I'd, anytime I could play ball, that's what I'd be doing. And then, obviously, like, the music thing, we always love to listen to music while we were playing ball. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, up until that point, you know, I, I wasn't really 
I wasn't really too focused on the future. It was just play ball whenever you could play ball. So basically, um, obviously, you know, dance music is progressing and, you know, then there's house music and techno. Um, did those things come into your vision um, in high school or was that later on? Um, it started to in high school because basically, you know, you'd watch much music and then you watch Rap City. And then there'd be stuff like Electric Circus and a few other shows. I can't even, I can't even remember the name. It's so long ago, but yeah, you'd start seeing uh, videos for other stuff. And then I think there was um, there was one host on Rap City. I think it was Oliver, mm. and he used to he used to do some shows where he kind of show music that wasn't exactly hip hop, but it was like what he thought was tied into hip hop. So through through that. I kind of got exposed to other things and then also the radio because you listen to certain stations like CKLN or whatever mm -hmm. and uh you know you'd have the map you'd have um was it master plan was on the 88.1 I think master plan was like 89.5 89. yeah yeah so yeah. you listen to that and then you just leave your radio on on whatever station and basically from there other things you, come you on. turn it on and you hear other things so slowly you know the exposure started creeping in and then i remember one one vivid moment was like seeing videos for stuff like uh devotion by nomad mm -hmm. um obviously goldie's inner city life was a big one because when okay. i heard that i was just you, you, know, you so you, you skip, changed everything you, you skip forward quite a bit there so so basically what would you say um was like the first rave music that you heard where you said wait a minute because i know i know how much you love hip-hop so hip-hop is like in your life and you know what i mean but for you especially you too because you're very picky about things uh so this so for you to get grabbed by something it must have been pretty uh amazing so when what did you hear that said whoa what is this yeah i, th I mean for me like like i said before i think it was basically i saw the video for inner city life and mm -hmm. I was kind of like, what's this? And then that's all right. So ninety four would it be would be your entryway? Yeah. Way. yeah. yeah. So so ninety three? No, not yet. Well, I mean, I had um, it was one of my uh, dad's close friends' sons. He used to he used to listen to a lot of house music, so he used to slide me mixtapes here and there. Mm. And um, most of it, most of it, I wasn't that into. Like there was mm. a couple of hip house things that I thought were cool. Mm -hmm. But and then obviously like here and there you'd hear like stuff like Technotronic and then okay. Snap. But right, yeah. For for the most part, I was still fully focused in hip hop. Right. So you heard Goldie's Inner City Life. Now, yeah. what's the next step when you're like, okay, this is different. This is this is obviously not hip hop. This is like, um, how did you find out more about jungle music at that well, time? Yeah. So basically from. From that music video i saw the logo that you have on your hat right there and uh i went down to hmv and kind of looked for look for the cd and then i saw a couple other cds with that logo and then i also saw basically the reinforced enforcer cd so mm -hmm. i just grabbed all of them and started listening to that nice. and then that kind of transitioned me into buying electronic music and then yeah, you'd, I'd just be going to HMB, going through their electronic section, you know, buying various different things, various different compilations. And then, like I said before, realizing a lot of it wasn't available, you know, on CD and that to get most of it, you had to start, you know, venturing into the vinyl world. So that's when I started hitting up all the record stores and yeah, grabbing my records. Yeah, so your entryway is really unique compared to a lot of people because a lot of people came into it through the raves and stuff like that, and even just via radio. But you came into it like you you found it on uh, video a video show, and then found yourself in the record stores. Um, so once you started going to the record stores, was it was because I, I, I know we met probably around I feel like we met in ninety four ninety five. But no, I, it would have probably been a bit later because. Mm. You know, I wasn't going. I wasn't going religiously. I was just going there and then mm. kind of just picking whatever. At that point, I didn't even know you mixed the music, so oh, okay. You know, I just buy a record, listen to it from start to finish. It was. Yeah, right. I, didn't, I didn't realize there's music you mix together and see. I totally, I totally. Like, uh, my timeline's off, like as to when we might have met. But so when, um, 
so now you've you're into the music you're buying the music um how did you find out about the scene it was it was from going to record stores because i started meeting other, other people that were buying records and mm. you know then i found out that they were you know going to jams and playing them at jams and who was some of the first people you met uh one guy was david k on okay yeah, and then he was uh i guess he he was uh, he was uh djing out in kingston like he was going to university there and he moved back to toronto mm -hmm. and uh yeah i think basically he got caddy used to have a bunch of a bunch of different nights mm -hmm. i'm trying to think he, he used to have like a monday night it's jungle nation yeah on monday yeah, yeah. yeah. so i think he started inviting me to come out to those nights and check it out and then yeah from there from there i got more into partying and right. started going to raves but yeah it was a lot it was a lot later on do you remember most what, people what what was the first rave you went to that had an impact on you uh, i can't i can't even remember like some yeah i can't i can't even remember I'm, one of the one of the early ones i remember well it's not that early it was it was probably around like 98 was uh a wall okay yeah so things are in like big swing at this point yeah yeah because i mean before that like we just you know I'd, I'd be going to smaller like uh you know smaller like club things but i was still yeah i was still in high school i was still kids so i wasn't going out that much and then mm -hmm. again i was i was more focused in in playing sports and all that so okay I so was partying full tilt so you're collecting the music um you're meeting some of the players um when was it that you decided you know what I would like to start DJing and getting more involved in the music. Well, that's that's actually kind of funny because I never actually thought about being a, like DJing drum and bass or mm. uh, jungle. Basically, what happened was from hanging with Dave. You know, he'd always he'd always play out, and uh, I wasn't huge on his whole entire selection. Like yeah. some of it was good. Like he liked all the Book of Me stuff and uh, all the. Um, I guess all the head stuff and all that kind of stuff. He played like a lot of Aphrodite things as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd start bringing my records and getting him to play them. And then I think he just kind of got fed up and then he'd start walking away from the Dax mid set. He kept trying to tell me to play. And then I, he basically like tricked me into playing because he'd like say you have to go to the washroom. Mm -hmm. And then the tunes would be playing and then whoever the promoter was see the tune running out and they'd be like, well, put on another record. <laughs> right yeah right because i know you, i remember you started to st frequent a lot of places like you was to go to milano and, and and all this stuff so um when 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 would you say you were like started to like be fully immersed in the scene and i mean because you used to go out regular and then also too i know that you know um you started doing events with maurice and um you know you were playing you were playing at a bunch of early so early raves so when around what time was that that you started playing i would out? say prob probably uh playing out would be around 98. okay yeah yeah, yeah. around 98. yeah maybe not late 97. yeah so the bug for recording and producing the music um when did that come um once i started playing out like i was fascinated with the music and how it was made and I mean, you'll you'll remember too, because we used to always kick it, and then I'd come hang yeah. out at your studio, and then mm -hmm. you you were on college, I think, at the time. Yeah, the college then, studio, yeah. Yeah, and then you'd always, you know, you'd always open up projects and show me, and you were you were always like, "This is super easy, man. You can do it." Yeah, you know? yeah, it was crazy that uh, that was the hardware days when we had the Emu and with the Kurtzwell K two thousand. Even before that, I think we had an Akai. Um, but for those that don't know, let me tell you, in the early days, I'll tell, I don't want to embarrass you, but Gabe loved the Amen. He did. Um, and he <laughs> he was, in, in those early days, I remember distinctly, he was really, really fascinated with cutting it up and how you can manipulate the break and so on. And then, so I remember you coming over and just being interested in the patterns and also to the conga drums, right? Yeah. Which. Yeah which was something that I remember you were really interested in like having congas and conga patterns mixed with the Amen. And then my first, uh, remember hearing some of your first stuff, boom, it was that. It was like congas <laughs> and Amen's chop. Um, and um, 
I think a lot of people know that you aim in your way in originally, right? Um, yeah, I mean, pro- probably. I mean, I mean, the first time yeah. I actually um, got into being in the studio and producing was actually with Jesse, okay. who I met through uh, I met through Maurice. Right. Like, See, uh, I didn't know that. I thought it would have been with yeah. Alan with Stranger. No, we we had a crew called Dark Logic. Okay. Um, you know, which was spearheaded by Maurice. He introduced me to Jesse, who was living out in Niagara Falls at the time, and then eventually he moved to Toronto. And uh, he was roommates with Capital J. And yeah, he was actually the first person that had me in the studio and then sat down with me and, you know, let me put a tune together. Well, that's amazing because a lot of people, Jesse is actually Jesta, guys. And um, these guys have an album coming out together on Metalheads. Um, and they have a partnership that goes beyond music and into yeah, all sorts of other things. So Yeah, he's also one of my other best friends. You know, he's like... The people I talk to most are probably him, uh, you, Brad, which is Lush, uh, yeah. Rumbleton. Yeah, yeah. So that's amazing to me because you see, I I didn't I didn't know that part because um, I think the first time that I recall your um, productions, I know you were working with Alan quite a bit in the early days. You guys almost had like a partnership. Um, yeah, it was uh, basically like um, Alan is stranger guys. Yeah, so. we got like I. I got exposed to him. I think there was a Toronto Jungle Jam or something like that. And then we went and checked them out. And then uh, we started talking after that. Cause like back in the day they had the forum you can network off of. Mm. And we basically realized we lived like 10 minutes from each other. So he right. lived up at Woodbine and Danforth. I was down by the beaches. So we just started hanging out and then started making beats together. Like he was, he was already, you know, full swing into it at that time. So we invested in a bit of equipment together and then yeah nice i remember yeah. you know what? it's all starting to come back to me now a little bit because this is like early 2000s and um it's funny because we were coming out of this tech step period and you had uh obviously loxy and ink digital breakage um even you know shy um and all of these guys started producing like um a jungle influence hardcore sound again and and i know you were lashing out tunes like that um like aiming tunes congas pads yeah. reeses stabs and um it was it fell in line with that and some of your early music and i know with alan as well was kind of on that same tip yeah. um yeah man tell us a little bit about like when you first got into uh recording jungle in the in the early 2000s there because I know a lot of people look back on on that early material that you did, and uh, I mean, because you kept that going for a long time. I mean, that broke that broke you into the Renegade Hardware period as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Basically, uh, we just made what we liked, right? So, yeah. you know, and unfortunately, like I mean, I was. Uh, well, I mean, you introduced me to Goldie. You introduced both Alan and myself to Goldie when he was playing a show in Toronto. Yeah. So we're pretty we're pretty fortunate because, like, right at the beginning of, of my career, got introduced to Goldie. Then I got put in touch with Ink. So, right. you know, I already started with my foot kind of in the door. So, um, my timeline might be off a little bit. So, um, but I had the impression that you were doing stuff with Renegade Hardware. How did you meet Clayton? Uh, that was through Ink and Loxy. Okay. Um, I got introduced to Loxy after Ink, and it was uh, via Chris, who was a and ring at Metalheads. Mm-hmm. And then he put us in touch together. Right. But yeah, I mean, obviously, I was talking to, well, I mean, I still talk to, you know, I still talk to Giles and Andrew quite a bit. You know, Giles is basically, you know, I would basically view him as my brother. You know, right. we're like that close. But yeah, I mean, and because they were immersed in Renegade Hardware, they uh, they brought me through and the rest of the crew, like everybody we were working with. I mean, you even, you know, you even got intro as well because you had a stuff, you had a thing on TOV, remember? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I always used to send my stuff to, because it was the AIM days, so I was always yeah. sending stuff over to Loxy, um, but- Yeah, and then I, we, had, we had a thing on, um, I mean, one of my very first vinyl, like I think the first vinyl I had was on, uh, it was, I think it was called Crimson. It was one of, it was one of the Vinyl Syndicate sub labels, mm-hmm. and then from there, the second one, 
I had the thing on MDZ04, which was a Metalheads compilation, and then Architecture. You were you were on one of the tracks. You were mm. in Breach. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna ask you, what was? Do you remember what your first release was? Yeah, I think yeah, it was the Crimson thing. Okay, it was the Crimson thing. Yeah, and it, was then, like a, and it was like a little white label thing. I have no idea what. So, what year was the Metalheads release on it? Um, do you remember? It was a compilation, yeah, right? Yeah, I think it was like 0304. 0304. And and then when was your introduction to Renegade Hardware? Uh, pretty much. At the, well, I mean, it all pretty much happened at the same time. At the same time. Yeah, because you started to build a really good relationship with Clayton. Um, yeah. and, and you started to... The, when was your first trip over to England? Uh, I think the first time I played was 05. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah, my first gig abroad was playing Renegade Hardware at the Hymn Club. So I remember that, and they recorded that as well. Who MC yeah, for yeah. that? Um, it was MC Sterling, who was one of the at the time he was one of the Metalheads MCs as well. Yeah, I I, I remember hearing that set. You know, um, yeah, because it was around the same time that I started touring. Because um, I was with Digital Soundboy, and then and uh, going over, and I got onto UMC and started traveling over often. But um, so you start playing the Renegade Hardware parties. Where were those at the time? Yeah, it was the N Club mainly. The they Club. were like the main one was at the N Club, and then they do. Uh, I remember playing a thing at Bristol. I can't remember. Can't remember the name of the event. Uh, sorry, of the venue, but yeah, I mean the main one was Hardware at the end. So you go play Hardware at the end, and then you just you know book a bunch of gigs around that. So this was like that time where I remember. You would say, you know, you're made, you're making ammunition to go in there just for hardware. You would never go to go down there without a couple of like, you'd be like VIP time, right? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just made tunes to draw on everyone, and then yeah, you know, everybody would just throw down dubs, and then you just, you know, after after the night, you kind of trade them with everyone. So I, I heard you and uh, you and Loxy uh, pretty often go. Uh, trying to take each other out just, but just for fun nah, well i mean <laughs> no it was, it, was, it was everybody like um mm. you know i was pretty tight with the vc boys as well vicious circle mm. um you know chase and status were also you know part of the hardware camp back then it was it was just it was just a whole vibe like everybody yeah. would just make tunes for that night yeah and then, who, see who you know you wanted you wanted, other, you wanted right? you wanted yeah. to yeah you wanted to have the best tunes and you wanted to have the best set yeah and uh you know, of there, there are a lot of good memorable sets. Like I've played with uh, Spirit, mm. I played with uh, J with Giles, and I played with Loxy. You know, so you know what? Um, that Renegade Hardware period obviously is super impactful um, in drum and bass. Um, you know, can you tell us like what that whole experience of being part of that movement was? Because at that time, that was arguably one of the biggest movements in drum and bass. And so I want to big up Clayton um and it was mark right was the part his partner at the time yeah, yeah. and then yoko was in the office um, yeah. so you were a really big part of that um tell us a little bit about the whole renegade hardware period well it was just it was just it kind of felt like family you know it was like a little family vibe like mm -hmm. obviously from day one like when i when i went down there i got introduced to everyone and everybody's just super cool so you just felt like family which yeah. is why you know, which is why I was so drawn to working with the label and just working with them on an ongoing basis. Cause you know, Clayton would like house me up a lot of the times I went there, you know, he was like a super host, Giles would as well, same with Andrew. Um, yeah, it was just family. And then on top of that, like the events were fire. Like there's nothing like playing at the end club. It was like a little circle in the middle of the dance floor. Like basically the club was, it was like two tube station tunnels. Mm. they're just parallel to each other you had the booth in the middle of the dance floor so yeah, yeah it was it was incredible you know you know what and it's a pretty diverse label because you know they championed uh the neuro sound um also too like what a lot of people would call golden era drum and bass like the really big tracks like messiah and so on and then there was like little factions i find within the actual label because you know i was a really big fan of loxy and ink and yourself and um you guys essentially had a very different sound which to me was a little bit more on the jungle and hardcore side of things and then there was like a lot of guys doing neuro and just straight up dark dark darkness right so um yeah it was an amazing label so you got a big up renegade hardware um all right next up your most memorable event 
in England where you said, this was amazing. You know, I'm so happy. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, I mean, there like a, there was the first time I played the N Club, which was the first time I went over. Um, yeah, I just got wasted before I played because Yoko, mm. oh, rest in peace. Yoko basically had a case full of these mango drinks and just <laughs> gave them to me. Yeah. And, I didn't realize they were like mango vodka drinks, but I just smashed the whole case. Like I just got annihilated. You're played the for that. <laughs> play, played the set, fell out of the booth. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, there, was, there was another time um, also at the end club. Um, I remember I made Frankie Guns just to play his last tune and uh, dropped it as the last tune. Ink ran in the booth and like, you know, does what he does, got all hype, rewind the tune, you know, yelled, fuck off, like, just in my ear. Nice. I come out the, you know, snatch a CD so he could play it as his last tune. Nice. Come out the booth, and then uh, my girl at the time who was there was all, looked all worried. She's like, oh, my God, what happened? Like, are you okay? Did you just get in a fight? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, no, it's all cool. Uh, they want to take the tune for hardware. <laughs> <laughs> nice so uh, big up frankie guns he's a dj here in toronto um used to work at play the record and at the time uh gremlins made a chain called frankie guns so <laughs> i remember yeah. that yeah and man. then he named himself after it <laughs> okay so that, we're gonna... that, that, that's more of a joke uh we, we like to wind up super megan oh okay yeah. <laughs> so the horsemen tell mm. tell us what the horseman is and who who's involved in the horseman and what it was all about all right, so originally um, there was Loxy, Ink, Dylan, and uh, Keaton, and they were the four horsemen. And basically, when we started talking to uh, Loxy and Ink, they played a show in Toronto, and then we introduced them to the whole crew. It was, um, there was Mutt, there was Stranger, there was uh, yourself, Overlook, um, Tim Titan. It was just a bunch of people. Yeah. And then... Uh, they're like, you know what? We're all like-minded. We we should basically form a crew. And then uh, they're shooting around names. So I remember we're in the hotel room and then uh, Giles Inc. wanted to call it the International Beats Crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, is, which isn't a bad name, but we were just, you know, at the time, we were just like, nah. And then Andrew was like, well, we, we already got the four horsemen. Why don't we just call it the horsemen and bring everybody into it? But okay yeah it was just basically uh a crew involving a lot of uh yeah i mean there are people like frisk as well uh skitty knowledge who is now sb81 phobia sky fission there were just a bunch of us and then and a few yeah, projects we, came out of that as well right yeah there were a few different albums on hardware um a bunch of eps on you know inks label architecture loxy's label uh, extinction agenda you know in cylon as well nice mm. all right um i know you make a variety of genres but how would you describe your sound to people if you were to describe it um i don't know moody yes it's, and, and of, uh, minimalism just, as well right like in attention yeah, yeah. to detail yeah yeah I guess, yeah sure. all, all those things you know it's yeah i basically treat it like uh you know kind of an extension of yourself you know you just when you make music it's you're just kind of expressing yourself and you know yes that's pretty much it so yeah put it <laughs> all in the music yeah yeah moody minimal <laughs> yeah. for sure well you know what you've really you know influenced me especially recently just like um you know i could hear you in my head sometimes you know <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm cussing you you're like you don't need that edit <laughs> take that edit out um yeah. attention to detail and um yeah just attention to great quality and great quality of sound pushing things I, you, you know i find that that you really push things you don't just you know take a break you use it as it is you always like eq it a certain way and um turn it into something else and that's really inspiring to me as well you know yeah so we're gonna take things back a little bit um because you know what uh reinforced means a lot to myself and you and i remember distinctly back when you used to come over to the college studio uh we were both fascinated with the parallel universe album and then obviously timeless dropped and i mean 
just we were obsessed with it uh especially reinforced and metalheads at the time so um mm -hmm. recently you've uh you've put out something on reinforce the enforcers 22 yeah uh, uh with Rumble rumbleton myself. yeah 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 tell us a bit about how that came about and you know well so basically um ryan rumbleton and myself we were you know we were in england at the same time we were playing uh rupture together and at the time i think uh there was stretch dextrous and a bunch of other cats from uh from that era decided to come to rupture for like uh I guess for like a reunion, for like a birthday party or something, like a reunion or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, basically by the end of the night, we got, you know, we got to meet them and we were just chatting a stretch. And then he was like, yeah, you know what? Like, I think I'm gonna start doing this again. And then we're, we told, we basically told him, we're like, yeah, if you guys ever bring back Reinforced, man, we'd love to, we'd love to do something for it, you know? Like, yeah, we're down, you know? So years later, he kind of approached, uh, but, well, he, he hit up Ryan and he's like, yeah, I want you guys to do an enforcers and, uh, specifically together, you know, he wanted us to collab on it together. And Ryan and I had done a lot of music together in the past. Like, uh, his very first record was a collaboration with me on Paradox's label outsider it was outsider 22. So it's kind of fitting that, uh, the enforcers one is also 22 yes the the enforcers right, 22 right behind you <laughs> I'm, I'm a very good friend because there's 70 canadian dollars <laughs> it's total to bring in but i want to big up uh stretch um ako yeah and big um, shout out to mark mac as well like he yes both of them amazing to work with super humble guys you know yeah and they've been so busy man like to be fair i said to brad it was just like especially right now we're in the recession inflation's high i can't keep up um i know that uh stretch just started a new label i think what's it called defenders no not defenders um there's oh geez what's the new one I, i'm horrible with names yeah so. <laughs> but anyways he's just started a new imprint um and i mean just just on the stretch stuff alone but I'm so happy that um, I was able to get my first hate, hate 03, because I missed the first two. And there's a Tom and Jerry coming to your house, I believe, that might have my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know what? Taking it back, because you met those guys at Rupture, and I want to send a really big shout going out to Mantra and Double O for kind of spearheading this whole new... People get mad when you say it's a jungle resurgence, but basically bringing back those original sounds of jungle and hardcore. And um, two years ago, before the um, pandemic, it was like, you know, you saw like a lot of the old school figures coming back, a lot of the old labels coming back. And I mean, when I say a lot, I mean a lot, like almost the whole Moving Shadow stable, um, suburban gate base guys. You have uh, Mark Ranger and the Kemet crew, Redskins. Um, the list goes on and on on top of all of the new labels and new artists um how do you feel about this whole new movement in drum and bass that kind of harkens back to how, why we got into the music in the first place well i think it's healthy man and you know at the end of the day there's room for there's room for everything and everyone so i'm all i'm all for it you know and then you know it's it's kind of like as you said rupture spearheaded that but also what's cool about rupture is it doesn't just focus on that like i think it it represents a good range yes. of music on that side of the spectrum for you know more more of a grown-up kind of sound for sure for sure yeah um i put the emphasis on different things i think because you know for me it was it was a great change it was a big creative change because you know year after year the sound changes and you go with it and some years you like it better than others certain like things come in and and you know quite recently a lot of what is happening po that's popular i'm i i let i don't like it as much you know what i mean but i'm mm. really you know i'm super passionate about uh the jungle and hardcore sounds and kind of going back to that early metalhead sound um and and so i'm really really excited about because you know now you're hearing people starting to take that sound and really take it to other places you know what i mean like you know for me it was like okay i wasn't around in 94 95 this is going to be fun i'm going to mm. start i'm going to start at zero and make this sound and kind of just 
come up and you know and you know not really worry about what anybody else is doing but just focus on well, what i mean doing. That, yeah. that's that's the best approach i have because like you know yeah. that's how that's how you stand apart <laughs> yeah so i noticed I, I know you've been doing some uh tu tutorials and mentoring tell tell me a little bit about some of that because i know you've been doing some online stuff well i mean yeah basically like uh I was doing a lot of it with uh, Audio Science Online, which is Amit's uh, Amit's platform. Big shouts to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing it with him for years, and uh, the whole emphasis of those tutorials were, you know, not to kind of teach a standard way of doing things. It's more, you know, as a as an artist who has a unique kind of approach and sound and aesthetic. Mm -hmm. You know, what's what's your what's your way of doing things and carrying it over. So that was the whole ethos behind that platform. Um, there are other people like Jay Kenzo was involved in it. Um, Distance, I can't, I can't remember the other artist, but I started off doing that. And then we got, a, Jesse and I got approached by Sample Genie to do uh, a, a sample pack. And then along with the sample pack, uh, they do it kind of in seasons. Mm -hmm. So we did a sample pack and then it involves two tutorials. So we done um, two, you know, collaborative, like Jesse and I have done two tutorials together. Right. You know, kind of the first one is uh, basically focused on how we do drums and how we approach drums. And then uh, the second one is yet to yet to be revealed. Yeah. In saying that, you know, there was a period um, a few years ago where you created a sound that a lot of people were calling tribal, um, very minimal, very, very heavy on the dub. Um, and that sound was really, really, everyone was like, yo, that's gremlin sound. And you kind of created a legion of artists, um, that sort of, um, you know, we're, you know, making that sound. And I'm, I know we've had some discussions cause like sometimes out of left field, somebody would copy you and you, you know, but you were actually really good in bringing a lot of people into the fray and mentoring a lot of these, these young artists. Um, Ink was talking about it, um, how there's a whole legion of, of artists that, especially at that time we're making everyone would be like yo it sounds like gremlins you know and you would play me stuff and i'd be like is that you and you'd be like no it's so and so and so um tell me a little bit about how you know you influence these this this crew but were you doing that on purpose and were you helping people out in that time well period? i mean I, I wouldn't say it was it was on purpose it was, mm -hmm. i mean basically you just meet artists that you know like uh a few of them were a younger generation and they just got influenced by some of the stuff we did but you know it's kind of cool because they they basically evolved into their own sound yeah you know and then we just all we just all kind of had the same kind of uh values and and views when it came to the music so yeah we got on as, as friends and we worked together mm -hmm. but uh i wouldn't i wouldn't take full credit for that as well there's you know there's also loxy inc and you know, the rest of us before that who were pushing that also sound. played a part of it yeah yeah but um can you name you know, some of the artists that um that you know are in your camp and that you know some of the people that you helped you know bring through well i mean yeah well i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't take <laughs> you don't take for credit bringing, for, no, no, yeah. for bringing them through because they're all yeah. they're all talented they did it on their own but mm -hmm. like yeah people like pessimist overlook uh clarity roughhouse you know holston mm -hmm. but again you know like i i mean they might have been like influenced by our cruise sound early on but they took it to a whole nother level you know so yeah and yeah. then ended up influencing us because i remember around the time when they were all breaking through i was kind of feeling i was going through one of those stagnant kind of stages mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff they were doing was uh influencing uh, influencing us in turn so yeah it's refreshing it goes in cycles and goes back and forth you know yeah I remember, no... I remember you coming over and being energized by some of the stuff you were playing me and being mm -hmm. like yo check this dub out and you just and i'd be like is that you and you'd be like no but you were really feeling like what they were doing yeah um, i mean i mean that was, there are other people as well but uh yeah you know they don't come to mind the same way because it's like you know there are people that come and go those ones those ones are all consistent they've been consistent for years so mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I know I know you really, really loved that minimal period um, because you you know even 
you know, fashion wise, design wise, you know, just you as a person, you love that minimal approach. But I'll be honest with you, when the breaks really started to come back in in this way, and we were even like all of your friends were piling on and we're like, Grams, man, we can't wait because we know how you flex with breaks. And I have to say, watching you um, over the last little while flex with breaks again, for me, it's been like an incredible like joy, you know what I mean? Because and also too, you know, you, you're, you're doing your tutorials and stuff like that. but. I was like, you know, that's some of my favorite stuff from you because like the early stuff that you did and I don't get me wrong. I like the minimal stuff, but I prefer <laughs> the break stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so well, I mean, it's, it's the same approach either way. Like, um, yeah, you know, I, I treat like the teams we make with breaks is the same, same process, same, same kind of uh, mental approach as doing something minimal, but you just throw a break over it. Right. Well, I know that. Um, a lot of the techno people were playing your mini minimal stuff, which was interesting, you know, in their techno sets. You well, know? they're doing that with, with some of the break stuff as well. Like I've seen, um, we have this tune like Monolith and I've seen some techno, some techno, uh, produce, well, some techno DJs playing it like way, pitch way down and it sounds totally different. So, yeah. So you've got some successful labels, uh, UVB. Um, tell us a little bit about, tell us what the labels are and, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about the labels. All right, well, yeah, UVB76, uh, that would be the the main label. Um, that was started with Rough House there over in Bristol. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, we kind of branched off. We did uh, Droogs, which right. is uh, which is kind of a sub-label, which is more, you know, kind of straight, straight drum and bass, kind of on the no U-turn. Mm-hmm kind of flex uh we've got 4625 which was a label which was dedicated to like crew collabs uh we had a couple of releases on that and then um there's also another sister label called uh stone tapes which is more of uh vega and overlooks kind of baby but it falls under the umbrella and then totally separate from that you know we just started uh shark with laser on head recordings uh that's with Brad and Jesse. And then we got the Lee Garden Historical Preservation Society thing as well. Yeah. Um, which will be coming as well. Um, I've also had a label called Audio Decay and then Technoir back in the days. Okay. So yeah. See, it's, it's even more than I know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I never, I didn't even keep up with yeah. everything. Um, but Lee Garden well, those Preservation. One, those ones were those ones were short lived, right? Right. So Lee Garden Preservation Society. Um, you have a me an album coming out with Jesta on Metalheads, and yeah. the title is Lee Garden Preservation Society. Am I right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that. Uh, yeah, that's the uh, that's the main one. Like actually, uh, you know, that's kind of spearheading everything. Yeah. And we, you know, we kind of wanted to evolve into like a alias for ourselves. Right. And then also, also the imprint, which is T T L G H P S, you know? Yeah. Which so, stands for that, you know? <laughs> so before we, we leave it, Shark with Laser on Head, um, what is going to be the approach with that label? And how did that come about? Because there's a history, a long history <laughs> of Shark with Laser on Head uh, in Toronto with us and J Mac, P Large, and the whole crew. So, yeah, there. So, well, I mean, it was, it was a, you know, it was a, it was kind of a joke back in the day, you know, we, uh, I had made a couple of tracks with Task, uh, called the E-Rave. Yes. You know, officially by Tillionaire and MCE everything. Yeah. You know, but we, yeah, we made a couple of tunes back in the day and then basically, um, it was, it was all done for fun. It was all for humor, but yeah, we figured, <laughs> you know, we, we figured it'd be good to like give a nod to that. Yeah. Brad was absolutely against it. Like he hated it, but <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we thought, you know, we wanted to give a nod to that. And then uh, basically it's, it's kind of going to be like a more kind of fun, jungly kind of label, I guess. Yeah. Because you got Tim Reaper is the first release, right? Yeah. So, yes. Big up Tim Reaper, Future Retro London. Yeah. And such Envious. Big things. Tim Reaper and Envious on the first one. Yeah. Uh, wicked. Wicked. Big yeah. up Equinox as well. The Cywax fam. Yeah. Yeah, big yeah. shout out to Tim. I've known I've known him for ages, and it's, it's good to work with him. I've also I've also got a bunch of different projects with him for his label. Like there was that remix uh, 
was it a year ago or something like that. I can't I can't even remember. We had a thing on drum and bass arena together as well. Right. There's more coming, so yeah, yeah. good to work with them. So, um, how long did it take you to make the Metalheads album that's forthcoming? Um, and just to let people know, there's a variety of BPMs on this album. It's an incredible album, and I can't wait for it to come up for everyone to hear it. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that was uh, basically, I guess, before Goldie cha- kind of challenged us to do it. Okay, I never, I never thought of making an album because my <laughs> output, <laughs> my output is slow, and you know, yeah. I, I used to just struggle just finishing like 12s or EPs. So that's why they, you know, in the past, it'd be a lot of like one tune on one side of a 12 because it'd just take me a while to finish tunes. But I would say it took us, you know, a year, a year and a half to to do from start to finish. Did you guys, uh, before you started it, did you discuss a concept or like an idea of what it was going to be like and what you'd like to have on there kind of thing? Um. I mean, we kind of had a rough, uh, I guess we had a rough idea. We wanted it to kind of be like a journey, you know, um, I can't even remember it was, it was a while ago, but yeah, basically I wanted it to kind of tell a story, mm-hmm. you know? So that was kind of the approach we had to it. And then obviously, uh, Goldie mentored us a lot throughout the whole process as well. He was very involved in it. You yeah. Know? You, um, you, do you have any artists that are featured on the record? Uh, like singers and stuff like that? or Maybe. <laughs> I can't say. Okay. I won't give it away. I won't give yeah. it away. All right. So off the Not, back of the but, album. But I mean, I mean, mostly, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I would say it's just, you know, we didn't really want it to be anything with any other, like we didn't want any collaborations or anything like that on there. Yeah. We wanted it to just be us. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, you know, I'm not going to give away any anything else because the album is still forthcoming. Um, mm. So, you know, we won't go there. Um, I know you've done some design work, um, and there was a couple of skateboards. Tell tell me a little bit about the design work because I know you did something for Metalheads, and you also did something recently for Reinforced. Is that right? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, I just I just like designing stuff. So, like, I think like. For for metalheads, it was like I, I designed like my own my own sleeve for uh, for the release on Platinum Breaks Jesse and I had, and then they ran a bunch of T-shirts, and then mm-hmm. you know I'm like I'll shoot I'll shoot Goldie designs, and then you know we'll see what happens with them. But mm-hmm. you know basically I just like doing designs with uh with reinforces. I just kind of help mock up a skateboard, and then again yeah. you know we'll we'll see what comes of it, but. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I've always just designed a lot of merch, and then like I've done over the years, I did a lot for hardware, um, helped helped out uh, architecture, right? You know, Cylon. So, so as far as just, I know, just just an ongoing thing, you know. Yeah, there's some definite design in the future as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not gonna end. I'm gonna keep designing stuff. So, yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, so. This is an interesting question. What is the best and worst thing about working in the music industry? I think the coolest part about it was not so much like the actual music business side of things, it's just like the friends I've made and the places I've been able to go to. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people, my pretty much everyone in my life, I wouldn't know if it weren't for music, you know, like you know, from my best friends abroad to like my friends here. You know, I know all of them through music yeah yeah you know, and i've seen i've seen some really cool places like i don't know if i would have gotten to japan on my own uh i've been to iceland several times like those are places i wouldn't you know necessarily have a chance of going to i've seen a lot of europe mm-hmm. you know a lot of the states so yeah and then the experiences you know nice nice so that that that's the best stuff right obviously yeah. a lot of really exciting things is happening for you right now like loads of releases you definitely got your foot on the gas and like I, and you know and i know we're all kind of like you know pushing right now i mean we're not getting any younger right so it's like we're all yeah. pushing and we're pushing each other 
you know trust me we we, we do talk when, when we talk we're kind of kicking each other in the ass yeah. on a regular basis and 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 being like yo because this guy I'm, I'm gonna big you up right now he's he's multi-talented you know what i mean so um yeah basically it's always just about making sure that we're optimizing our our our, our potential you know what i mean um because i think there's a lot of potential in the whole crew um you uh you know what i i forgot this question um mm -hmm. when we were talking about ink so you had done some house stuff with ink um but you also have some forthcoming stuff as well um tell me a little bit about what was out and then what's forthcoming well with ink yeah um lots man <laughs> i know i know that's why i was like, like you know what like i can't skip 20, over it 20 20 years worth of uh yeah almost 20 years worth of projects like yeah we've always like I guess that we're you know he's like family yeah you know we've always made music throughout the years done you know done house um the house recently, stuff's amazing as well Mind yeah me. yeah more recently we've got we've had uh we've had that 12 on dispatch yeah. uh juno dawn um we have a couple couple more 12s in the pipeline you know which i'm yeah. excited about yeah we just like we're still making music on uh on an on ongoing basis you know so yeah i know, didn't probably, want to skip over that you know <laughs> yeah no 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 he's uh yeah i mean like uh so i think because i like for those that don't know me i don't like a lot of the music i make like i get you know i get sick of it pretty quickly but some yeah. of my uh, like i i guess the more memorable release would be the heads platinum thing with jesse yeah. um some of the paradox releases and then uh Ink Giles and I have had a 12 on was it on tempo for you know for I think you released on there as well Frodo's label yeah it's still forthcoming the EP so hopefully okay. one day it'll come <laughs> yeah we, we we had this track called the light on there which is a a personal favorite by Giles and myself which is uh yeah it's like a moody aiming thing with uh nice pads in it yeah so um what other for uh who are actually who else are you collaborating with right now um nowadays like i would say I, like i'm kind of captain of kind of you know reined it in but mm. mainly you know mainly jesse mm. um yeah rumbleton we got a few things uh tim reaper um yeah and my crew like uh all the uvb 76 guys we you know we do our collabs here and there but you know for the most part aside from that and then ink loxy and then the regular you know your usual suspects like yeah kind of reining it in yeah no, know, just I, hear, cause I, hear. I i think it's because like i went through a period where my heart wasn't in it as much and then i would just you know, I, w I would just kind of send out half finished projects with people and collaborate with them. And then I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really be into like the end result of it. Right. You know, and I, I felt it kind of diluted the sound a bit. And yeah, ever, ever since then, I've kind of wanted to kind of steer away from like just doing too many collabs. Yeah. So if how that, do you, how do you feel sense. about the music right now? Like, like what's going on? Like, are you feeling excited about it? Cause I, I'm super excited because I feel like you can go anywhere with the music right now, you know? Yeah, I, find, I feel like, um, you know, what brought me into the music initially was the fact that it was so diverse and that you could basically do whatever you wanted. And it felt it felt you could, like you could experiment, you know, to your heart's content. And then for a while, it just felt like people were so fixated on, like, conforming and, like, fitting certain sounds and no one wanted to stray outside of the norm. Mm -hmm. and i feel like now it's gone back to that kind of experimental phase where you can just be as creative as you want so i'm really yeah i'm really happy with how things are going now definitely yeah, yeah for sure and i know i know there's a lot of yeah, stuff you can you can be yourself yeah for sure yeah i was saying you yeah. there's a lot more like world, on. world community happening with the jungle stuff right like um in the i keep saying jungle stuff because i almost feel like this whole new community is like and i know it's it encompasses drum and bass as well but um it's sort of like i think drum and bass is it's just this massive beast you know what i mean and sometimes when you make a sound like that's a little bit outside of what's being played in the big clubs it, you kind of sometimes feel dwarfed by what's going on especially with our tastes which is kind of really 
like the stuff that we truly love is is sort of outside of the box especially when you look at like what mainstream drum and bass is you know which leads leads to my next question actually because we can't skip over it what is the worst thing about this music business if you could if you could say <laughs> i mean we, I we mean, could probably make a long ass list real, really and truthfully how, how much time do you have like <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you've been exceptionally positive for this whole interview <laughs> <laughs> Pick that up, you know? Well, I mean, like, uh, I mean, well, I think one of the worst things is like the misconception everybody has about, you know, the life you live doing music. Like, everybody thinks that, like, everything is all, all sunshine and smiles, you know, and a lot of it's a struggle. Like, um, you know, you've got, you know, f you know, financially, it's not easy to make a lot of money doing music, especially this kind of music. Mm -hmm. you know you do have to make a lot of sacrifices for it like um you know I, I had a friend who used to always be like oh you know you're so lucky you get to do this and that but for a lot of the times i've had to work more than one job at a time you know sacrifice going out sacrifice doing things you know yeah and people don't people don't see all all the sacrifices you make behind the scene you know and then on top of that like when you do stuff like when you travel a lot you know you feel displaced there's a lot of discomfort around it you mm -hmm. it's yeah i mean you could go on and go on you know yeah. it's 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 not all it's not all rosy like that's why a lot of people who make music that sounds kind of genuine authentic or unique like the reason why it sounds like that is because they're not doing music necessarily to make a song that's cool that people will play out they're just kind of expressing themselves and you know, putting themselves in it and using it as a form of, uh, you know, it's also, it's basically an escape. It's a way, it's a way of, uh, you know, it's kind of like meditating. It's just a way of keeping sane. Yeah. Self-expression for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a really exciting time because I'm really happy that the experimentation's coming back, but also too, like if you look at places like rupture and obviously AKO and distant planet and glow city, um, all of this new uh, wave of things, it's great because even the dance floor stuff is having a lot of experimental, like, you know, you know, cause it's not like when you go to Rupture, people are brocking out like in both rooms, like, you know, but yeah. at the same time, um, no one would be surprised if you dropped something super experimental right in the, in the middle of a set. And I think, you know, that you have to send a big shot going out to, to double O mantra and obviously stretch and, everybody who's sort of like opening doors for like new things even us right now like we've been we've been all so busy we haven't been able to throw any shows but i know that there's a few shows coming up um in the new year because uh it's it's really up to us to kind of push it we've all been so busy like you know what i mean like as you said yeah. like you have to sacrifice so much to do this right but yeah. um yeah man um tell us about what you've got in the pipeline for the new year like I, I know that uh, you you actually are involved with the Last Planet venue. Tell me a little bit about that and any any sort of promotions that you. Well, I mean the, the the Black Creek Assembly venue. Um, you know, Drew and I have been friends for uh, for a very long time. You know, I'd say I've, I don't know at least a decade. Like I can't. You know, my memory is horrible. I can't even remember when when it was we met. But yeah. You know, I, I remember you introduced me to him, though. But yeah, you know, we've been friends for time, and we, you know, we've had a ongoing conversation. Like, I would travel a lot and play shows, and then play in these cool venues. Like, uh, there were like these flex spaces where, you know, it'd be a giant warehouse with like shipping containers, and in the containers, they'd have like artists, uh, you know, artist booths, and you know, little stalls where artists would do their work, and then they'd have some food and catering. And then at night, they would turn it into a venue and throw events. So we had a conversation about how nice it'd be able to be to do something like that in our own city. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Drew's like, he's like, yeah, a hundred percent. Like that's a vision he's had as well. He's like, it's just a shame that we can't really find venues in our city to do that. in. And, and, uh, fortunately at like I had, uh, I had an in through my, like my father's an architect and you know, I just mentioned it to him and one of his clients happened to have a space that kind of matched that. So 
Yeah. You know, we I brought Drew, we went and met up with met up with her and then, you know, the rest is the rest is what it is, you know, and you know, that's Drew's you know, Drew's done a fantastic job in kind of flipping it into that and it's still a work in progress, but so it's one thirty one McCormick, right? Is yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So for those that don't know, what we were talking about is this massive warehouse that Gabriel and our friend Drew, they've been actually throwing events in there and renting it out. And I, I played uh, for Trippy Nonstop, massive, massive event that you guys rented out for. And I know you've done tons of techno stuff there. Um, Last Planet is one of our leading companies for sort of like mixed genre bass music. They do everything from jungle to dubstep, like basically everything within the bass realm. Um, and this New Year's Eve, they're doing Dillinger and all of us get to play on it which is really great me and Brad is inner city dance you're on there yeah well yeah. you played you played the first event there like I played as well it was uh it yeah was we played of, there together the yeah. first DLC yeah yeah so um big up Drew big up Last Planet because they had a they just had a massive massive year you know um and, yeah and it's only bigger things to come as well like mm -hmm. you know obviously um Drew has a lot more experience in throwing events and and managing uh managing venues like he's uh you know that's what he does you know so yeah and also to you so you, you do some drilling here and there from what i hear <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you gotta have a day job you know <laughs> i remember when you used to throw, when you were throwing axes you know that, that is so you <laughs> you you gotta have a day job man. <laughs> like yeah, well sure. i mean what's, what's funny with that is like uh you remember wesley electrician mm. He's uh, roommates with Frankie Gunn, so we all we all stayed in touch, and we just play Call of Duty and Destiny and all kind of video games together. And they just talk about their job, where you know they they got treated very well, you know, to teach people how to throw axes, you know. And it was I was like, yo, <laughs> hook my hands up, and it was a it was a pretty flexible job, you know. They they looked after their employees, so it was a it was a good place to work for for the time I worked there. Let, yeah. out, let out some of your aggression about the music industry <laughs> yeah i mean, I, mean I, I would say i'm more con content doing what i'm doing now but yeah it was yeah you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was a cool job to have like had many jobs worked to play d um, yes you played the <laughs> alumni man you how long yeah. were you gonna play the record for i think like four years yeah something nice. like that um nice. yeah I've, i mean i've had many jobs over the years so Nice. Joyous, but like yeah shouts shouts to derek you know shouts to derek and arm like enjoying enjoying the core drilling nice you yeah. also you know what i forgot to mention this he used to be on the prophecy quite regularly yeah i mean we had, we had like uh what a 10 year run yeah on 89.5 well actually yeah. you know what it's 28 years now can you believe it this year yeah but i'm saying well uh, when, uh, when, I was, when you like, were on we're, there yeah yeah it was, it was for a good good 10 plus years i think yourself as well yeah so big up shadow uh dj prime uh and yeah. uh man there's so many people i could i could thank right now but maybe up, big up mr brown who is currently running it with scott free valiant and polaris the, the yeah. current current crop of guys on 89.5 but yeah man selling birding 28 years now we started on ckln then we moved to 89.5 and gremlins uh used to start coming in uh to regularly host so yeah, yeah man, i remember uh it was, it was still in the old building like yeah the house yeah, yeah we were there for for many years and then they brought it to the new the new location yeah yeah so is there anything that you want to promote any shout outs before we wrap things up uh <laughs> look out for the forthcoming album on metalheads um always check for you know for the labels uh shark with laser on head recordings uh lee garden historical preservation society um droogs uvb 76 4625 stone tapes all those you know check nice. those out yeah and then uh yeah m many more projects in the in the works you know, I don't, I don't really like, you know me, I don't, I don't like to yeah. announce stuff before it, <laughs> before it comes out. Gabriel hates <laughs> promoting, but we're always on him. We're like, bro, if you don't, if you don't tell people, they're not going to know. And it's, it's well, sort of I mean, one of those weird, weird, weird worlds, but now we're really all trying to promote each other's stuff and, you know, and share it. Cause it, 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 it really no, matters. For, for sure. Know? My, my yeah. thing is like, I like, uh, I like kind of, I mean, personally, it's just my thing where I just like having something get announced 
and drop it. And then, then you promote, you know, then you go and promote the shit out of it. But yeah, that's just, that's just my approach to it, you know? Yeah. You know, it, it's your personality all around. You're, yeah, you're minimal with I mean, everything. I mean, the know? thing, the thing too, is the way I look at it is like, you know, rather than promote something and people have to wait and wait for it, mm. as soon as you announce it, they have it within a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So especially with how disposable everything now, it just, that's, that's how, uh, that's how I look at it, you know? Yeah, man, for sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah, Anyways, yeah. I, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. We're going to definitely have you back down the line, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and you know, anytime, anytime you got anything coming up, just let us know, you know? Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me uh, on the thing as well. Yeah, man. Big up. Every, everybody subscribes. So Marcus can get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. You know what? I'm getting older. So I got to segue into something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, man. Big up. Thank yeah, you. Cheers. 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 Easy. Amen.